Hi there, it's not often that I have audio devices on my desk, let alone new ones. This here is the AK45, sent in for review by Banggood at no cost for me. This small box apparently contains an audio amplifier, remote control, FM antenna and a manual. The amp runs either from universal mains 90V to 240V AC or 12V DC, which makes it good for camping vans or boats. It connects to speakers of 4 to 16 ohms. Amazingly, nowhere does it state how many watts it produces. I would have expected this to be the first thing in advertising. Built-in protection circuits? What does that mean? A fuse? And what has this improbably large signal-to-noise ratio to do with this? Let's open it. The first thing is one of these, what Big Clive calls death adapters. Probably the unit has a euro plug and this is used to convert it to UK style sockets. These adapters are not very safe, not a very auspicious start, but let's continue. Yes, it's a 2 pin euro style power cable that comes with the unit. And here's the remote. And the FM antenna cable. And a qualified certificate? Sticker, whatever this is supposed to mean. The manual is basically a large folded sheet. One side is Chinese and the other side is in English, but it does contain just enough to set the unit up and running and some of the more confusing points of operating can be figured out by try and error. It is quite a small unit, which means the front plate is rather crowded, but it's all pretty clearly labeled. Two microphone inputs are provided, probably with an eye on karaoke parties. An enormous volume knob, but no balance control. On the rear we have the speaker terminals, two RCA inputs, the FM antenna socket and a 12 volts DC socket next to the AC socket. I don't trust the AC power supply until I inspected it, so for now I will use the 12 volts DC only. The DC socket says 12 volts 5 amps, that's 60 watts, giving us a clue on the upper limit of the power this amp can possibly send to the speakers. We shall of course measure that. The enclosure is all sheet metal. A magnet sticks to it, so not aluminium. Yet, the whole amp weighs less than 700 grams, or 1.5 pounds. When turning the 12V DC on, the amp springs unexpectedly to life. Notice the power button is off, so there is no actual power switch when using DC. And I can hear a short chirp and then a very noticeable hum. On closer inspection, I found that the large volume knob was all the way to max volume. When reducing that, the hum reduces as well until it gets inaudible. When switching to Bluetooth without connecting, there is a noticeable noise when putting the volume up. This is typical Bluetooth power supply spikes. I was fighting this noise just recently in my video that included the Bluetooth modification of an old Sony amplifier. I suppose if Bluetooth is actually playing, the noise will disappear under the music. To test that, I connected my MP3 player via Bluetooth to the amp. It actually sounds alright with these 3 way Panasonic loudspeakers. Time to try the remote. It needs two AAA batteries, which are not included. I connected the FM antenna and tried to find out how to do a scan of the FM band. I finally found in the quote manual that on the remote the button labeled REP standing for repeat in FM mode actually starts a scan. Who would have guessed that one? There is apparently no way of doing this without the remote. As with other radios I have tested lately, the scan is way too sensitive and allocates channels to stuff that is just noise. I have not found a way of purging these from the channel list afterwards. The poor result is not helped by the bad reception, which is at least partially caused by the terrible plug attached to the antenna cable. That plug is just loosely lying in the antenna connector. It moves freely and just looking at it causes it to fall out completely or at least enough to have no connection. You are better off using a real antenna cable or stuffing a blank end of wire in there. Playing music from a USB stick or memory card works ok. It starts as soon as you plug it in. It takes priority over all the other input sources, but of course you can then select a different source and the USB will stop playing. 
the manual states that for USB playback you can choose between six quote equalizer effects. I'm trying them here and I can't find any difference between them. And how to turn the effects off? There's no equalizer off, so one of the six is always selected. The player enumerates the songs internally when reading the USB stick. It includes files found in subfolders, but you have no clue what numbers each song has because the only thing shown on the display is the elapsed time, no titles, song number or any other data. But you can jump to a song if you guess the song number correctly by typing it in on the remote. I prepared a USB stick with various audio file formats, namely WAF, MP3, FLAC, AUG, AC3, M4A. Let's see which one works. This is a FLAC file. This is a FLAC file. This is an MP3 file. This is an MP3 file. This is a WAF file. This is a WAF file. The others were not recognized. I connected a microphone to one of the microphone sockets and mixing voice with a running program test, works test, fine. Test. One, two, three. But if you plug in a second one, be aware there's <laughs> just one control working for both microphones. A word how this amplifier uses the remote for volume. The remote controls the volume in a range from 0 to 30 as shown on the display. It does nothing with a big volume knob. The way this works is that you use the big knob to manually set the max volume corresponding to 30 and then adjust whatever lower volume you want by using the remote. This works the same way for all sources, line input, Bluetooth and radio included. Let's have a look at how this amp is constructed. Three screws are holding the lid. Despite the small size, there is still ample room inside this amplifier. There are three PCBs. The one at the bottom directly behind the rear panel contains the power supply and the actual amplifier. The PCB across from it behind the front panel contains the volume and tone controls and the two microphone input sockets. Above it is the PCB with the actual audio processor, FM and Bluetooth receiver, USB and card socket, display and buttons. There are very few active components visible on the two front PCBs. The bottom one has just a dual op amp, while the top one contains probably the brain of the whole thing, a GLE chip. I have not found the datasheet for that specific one, but I suspect it contains all the processing for Bluetooth and the other inputs. Let's have a closer look at the other PCB. On the right is the power amplifier. Immediately we see four identical inductors in a row with four identical capacitors and all on tracks that lead directly to the speaker terminals. This is a dead giveaway that this is a class D amplifier. Basically the input signal is sampled using a sawtooth signal and converted to a digital signal that looks like pulse width modulation. This happens usually at sawtooth frequencies of 300 to 500 kilohertz. The PWM is then amplified, which can be done very efficiently as the transistors are either fully on or fully off, so hardly waste any power. The LC filters at the output are converting the digital pulse trains back into analog by filtering away the sampling frequency. The fact that there are four LC filters means there are in fact four amplifiers. The reason is that in a 12 volt system, amplifier power is very limited. Even if you could drive the output rail to rail with no distortions, the maximum you can theoretically get is 12 volts peak to peak, which is about 4.3 volts RMS and with a 4 ohm speaker that translates to just 4.5 watts. To get more power, you either have to use heavy output transformers or non-standard speaker setups like 2 or even 1 ohm or use a second amplifier and connect them as a bridge system. The latter is what the designers of this amplifier did. The second amplifier for each channel is identical but gets a phase inverted input signal. The speaker is connected not to ground but between the two amplifier outputs so it sees the difference between them. 
If the top one produces bus 12 volts on the output, the other will produce zero, so the speaker sees a difference between top and bottom of plus 12 volts. If now the output of the top one is zero and the bottom one is plus 12 volts, the difference is again 12 volts, but from a speaker's point of view, the polarity is reversed, so the speaker sees plus minus 12 volts or 24 volts peak to peak, which allows a maximum of 18 watts for 4 ohm. That of course assumes amplifiers with distortion-free rail-to-rail outputs, which is generally not the case. So this amp will probably have something between 10 and 15 watts output at 4 ohms. Back to the PCB, but this time concentrating on the power supply. On the left, mains comes in and we have a soldered in fuse before there are the two red wires that lead to the power switch on the front panel. Then it's into the bridge rectifier and then into a smoothing cap. The actual chip and switching transistor running the power supply is hidden under the heatsink. There is the usual optocoupler to provide feedback to stabilize the output at 12 volts DC. Across the optocoupler is the usual interference suppression capacitor. They are mostly blue as is the case in this power supply too. For electrical safety, this needs to be a safety rated class Y capacitor because if it fails short, it would be a life threatening fault by connecting mains voltage directly to 12 volts DC. Class Y capacitors are designed to fail open, so you would lose the EMI suppression but otherwise still be safe. Next to the AC main socket, you see the 12 volts DC socket. The trace from the DC socket runs behind the transformer into a diode. Here is this section enlarged. D6 is the diode for the 12 volts DC input socket, while D7 is the actual output rectifier diode of the power supply. They are both connected together and share the same smoothing and filtering circuit. This is a neat solution. It provides polarity protection if your DC input has the reverse voltage, and if both AC mains and DC are connected, this would automatically switch the supply from the AC supply to the DC input depending on which source provides the higher voltage. But be careful with the voltage on the DC socket since caps in the amp are only rated for 16 volts. Not so great is the separation between the trace of the DC input jack and the next one which forms part of the high voltage side of the power supply. It's about 3 mm or a bit more than one tenth of an inch. This gap is probably enough but more doesn't hurt and it could have been easily achieved, especially because they did a lot of things right, like the cutout under the 100k resistors just visible on the top. On the underside the situation is similar. This here is the gap we are talking about. What about the interference suppression capacitor? Is it class Y or not? Unfortunately, its label is on the side facing the transformer and it's soldered in so tight that I can't bend it without probably breaking it. The best I could do is this. Besides the part number, I think I can see some safety logos. Looking up the part number unearthed this sort of data sheet. This is all it has as data. I enlarged the photo in the data sheet until it was possible to read that this is indeed an X1 and Y1 rated capacitor for 400 volts AC, so no problems here. This leaves the transformer as a potential safety hazard, but checking would be destructive, so I'm not going to do that and instead give them the benefit of the doubt. One last thing on the power supply. The power button on the remote only turns the processor and display off. The blue illumination of the volume knob remains on. When powered from AC, you can turn the amp completely off with a power switch on the left, but when connected to DC, like in a camper van, you need to unplug the amp or find some other way to turn the 12 volts off. Now that operation and built-in construction are dealt with, let's look at the technical performance starting with the bandwidth. I don't have a fancy scope with tracking generator that does it all for you. This is how I measure amplifiers. First, the amp input is connected to a sine wave generator and the output is connected to load resistors, in this case 4 ohms. For stereo amps, I have to do measurements on a per channel basis. The RMS voltage over the load resistor is measured with the Agilent 34401A and also monitored with a scope. I also run a calibration run with no amp to accommodate for the multimeter bandwidth and linearity of the generator. For bandwidth, the volume of the amp is adjusted until it shows as close as possible 1 volts at 1000 Hz on the output. 
Then I start a script that remotely steps up the sine wave generator frequency from 20 Hz onwards to 50 kHz and records the corresponding RMS volts. You see it running here. The step size increases automatically with higher frequencies or you would sit here forever. In total I measure 92 frequencies which takes about 3 minutes. I don't run it faster to let everything settle down before I take measurements. The script saves the measurements in a spreadsheet and also converts the voltages into decibels for plotting. I run the test twice, one time for the right channel and one time for the left. I did not reset the volume control after I had calibrated the right channel to 1 volt at 1 kHz assuming that the left would be automatically doing the same. To my surprise the left channel was a bit louder. I checked that multiple times and it is so and not caused by for example different load resistor values. The amp has no balance control so you can't easily correct this. I don't think it's too much of a problem and furthermore this effect may only be on the line input since this is the only source I tested and for that you could add an attenuator to the left line input if it really bothers you. But looking at this I suppose there are bigger things to worry about. The bandwidth is not exactly straight and fans of thumping bus will be severely disappointed. From 100Hz and lower there is basically nothing there. The highs drop off much slower but the drop starts quite early. I have to say that this graph is of course affected by the position of the tone controls. There is no notch or marking on the bus and treble controls marking the neutral position so I tried my best to put them exactly halfway between the two end positions. This is the graph of how the tone controls affect the signal. It is interesting that the bus really only works the low end and for high frequencies the graph becomes identical to neutral. Same for the treble control. Overall bus will help a little with the amps weakness at the low frequencies but not a lot. Max treble on the other hand goes quite crazy in boosting the high frequencies but I suppose when applied with moderation it can be used to compensate for the amps slow drop of the high frequencies. To test for max power I fed a 1 kHz sine wave and increased the volume until the amplifier clips. While the clipping is probably gone at 7.6 volts, it seems there's still a visible distortion. So I lowered the volume a little bit further. 7 or 6.8 volts seem to be as high as you want to go. That translates to 12.3 to 11.6 watts at 4 ohm. With no input, there's quite a lot of noise about 44 millivolts RMS. Increasing the scope's horizontal speed reveals it's composed of spikes coming probably from the power supply and a sawtooth signal which is clearly a leftover from the class D sampling. The spikes make measuring the frequency tricky but just visually a period of the sawtooth is about 3 divisions on the screen and at 1 microsecond per division this would be about 330 kilohertz. I connected both DC and AC power to the amp and upon turning the amp off the spikes are gone. So they come from the switch mode power supply. Finally I used my Marconi TF2331 distortion factor meter I repaired in an earlier video. I refer you to this video for more details how this works. I'm using 1 kHz as a test frequency and the TF2331 is in the white band 100 kHz setting and the scale factor is 3%. This means the lower scale is applicable and the total harmonic distortion of the amplifier is about 1.2%. Switching to narrow band discards any distortions above 20 kHz. And this lowers the readout quite a bit allowing me to switch to the next lower range of 1%. Now the upper scale is applicable and the total harmonic distortion is a tad below 0.4%. Well, let's be clear, for £20 or $25 for an amp with radio and Bluetooth and MP3 capability you can't expect true hi-fi quality. But as I can attest with good speakers it sounds alright, certainly good enough for use in a camper or similar places where space is at a premium. If you like my videos don't forget to like and subscribe and help growing this channel and consider becoming a Patreon, the links in the description. Thanks for watching.